it's actually really hard to follow Brian because he has this most phenomenal supply of stuff and I'm just so horribly grounded in how you run higher and further education colleges <coughs> and, and how um, and how schools um, and how schools operate because I've worked with them. So, so I'll be much more downbeat and much more nitty-gritty than Brian. Although some of the things that we've got are actually <clears throat> we're seeing the same things, um, and, and I'll probably skip over some of that to um, to speed things up a little. So, get that first slide. Got it. Okay, so that's the plan of the talk. I'm going to do a no-brainer prediction, a handful of prediction. No-brainer. I'm going to talk a little bit about technology. Some of them have already been talked about, so I can skip over, but some of them haven't, and I think they're significant for us. I'm going to talk about emerging educational trends, the things that I think you see coming. As Brian said, the future is now. You can see some of that stuff, but I, and I think that, that there's a question about whether we're taking serious note, and then I'm going to come out the end and take some more risks and talk about, uh, and talk about academic taboos and, and disruption. So so the first one, and I, I, this is one of my, I, you know, I use this slide occasionally, and I use it to remind myself, we, we, we overestimate, and it says technology, Amara's law, we overestimate the effect of technology in the short run, and we underestimate the long run. And this is why you get these predictions, and then people go, ah, you are wrong. Actually, they hadn't waited long enough. Within Brexit at the moment in the UK, we've got exactly that, the short-term prediction. Nothing happened. Keep waiting. And I think you can put change, social change, etc., all sorts of things in place of that word technology. And so this is the problem. Are we talking 2025? Are we talking 2030? Are we talking 2015? It doesn't come in 2025. That doesn't mean it won't come 10 or 15 years later. Some things may be slower burn, um, but nevertheless will still come. So you've got to keep watching. My, this is my safe prediction. Um, lifelong learning in the future will increasingly be taken online and so no student will graduate without experience of fully online learning and, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday you know that, that I, I see that as being the norm and and because online education will be a normal part of all university activities all academic staff all professors will teach online routinely alongside face-to-face and actually, to audiences like this, I actually, I don't get people going, oh, sign of the devil. But if I walk around my campus right now and show that to professors randomly and say, this is it, I don't get that positive reaction. They don't see that really coming. They don't really agree with me about that. They say, well, some of those funny universities, you know, those cheaper and less good universities, they'll do that stuff, but... but but we know what we're doing. So there's a huge conservatism and a huge complacency, I think, within the teaching professions in general. I think this applies in colleges, and I think still to a significant extent applies in schools, that, that there is not really an acceptance that those changes are actually going to come and are going to come soon. For my own university, I think we need to be there by 2030, latest, preferably 2025. I said this in 2015, and that was 10 years, and it's shrinking, even now, and I don't know if we're going fast enough, and we think we're pretty innovative. Uh, so technology is the problem. The problem is that technologies will not stand still while we're doing all this thinking about how to reorganize ourselves. And this was a list that I prepared for our senior management team a short while ago. I, it was a longer talk, but it's the things that I said that these are going to hit us over the coming few years. You can see them rolling in on us now in every talk, and we're going to have to engage with all of this stuff somehow while we live in this turbulent world. The top one, security, that is going to be really hard. I ran IT security for the University of Edinburgh. It was a nightmare. Open universities, everybody did everything they liked, and we were trying to protect it and keep everything. And the data, as Catherine said, the data we gather now is even more sensitive about our learners because this is about how they learn, it's about how they type, it's everything about them. So, so that is going to be a real challenge for higher education institutions. I've had an embarrassment of major data loss once. It was quite embarrassing, I'll tell you. So there's a set of those things. Some of them have been talked about in mobile, um, internet, um, semantic web. Intelligent agents, I think. We are, we've had too many promises in the past about, about the intelligent tutor, about the computer tutor. We've had too many promises about what it would be able to do, and I think everybody's now become um, kind of dismissive of it, and it won't really work. But the signs are that what is coming through now actually will have enough power and the 
coding and the understanding of how to generate um, uh, materials that will enable people to interact with, um, with bots um, and, and have a constructive and high-level engagement with them will actually significantly change what we, are, what we are actually able to do and we need to keep up with it. Data-driven world, I've got a mention of that later. And actually moving into this personalized world, me and Freezy, free and the easy models dominating, all of that sort of stuff is actually really the opposite of what we do. And that mindset clash between our closed environment and the more open and free and easy environment, we see right now, because when we talk to our students about what they actually do, most of what they do, I mean really most of what they do, is not on our systems and is not in our stuff. It's out there on their own. And it's collaborative and they share invisibly, um, really fluidly at the present time. The other ones I think, I always have 3D printing at the bottom and I still haven't figured out what 3D printing will do. I know it will do something but I still haven't figured out what 3D printing will do. It would be interesting to see. But I think that the four above it, video audio is easier than text. You don't type stuff anymore. You know, all that typing will go away, just will go away. Speech recognition and real-time translation. I don't know what that does to the dominance of the English language, as it happens, because if you put a little plug in your ear and Catherine speaks to me in French and I hear her in English and I speak back in English and she hears me in French and it runs in real time. I don't know what happens then actually to language and language teaching and all sorts of stuff that's gone on, but you can see that coming through. You just take your phone out these days and it basically almost just about does that. Um, so as that develops, that will be a really interesting thing, especially in the internationalized universities and especially to student flows. I think real time, I think digital physical co-presence, and I've got that Star Wars Princess Leia being beamed in, at the moment, video conferencing and things of, of coming into rooms where people are physically present, you are a poor, very, very poor relation when you come in by video con. If you are beamed into the seat right next to you and you use VR as your way of dealing with it so you're all the same in that setting, that will transform what it means to run a class with people out there and people here because you will all be in a sense here and you will all be out there. And those technologies are also coming through at the present time. And we need to think about how in universities we are going to deploy those, um, those, those technologies and, and be on top of them as we go through. But if technology is, going to ch is changing um, and won't stand still, education won't stand still either, and we can see plenty of signs of that, I think that one of them actually is in, in the increasing in, in interest in learning analytics and, and around digital education. We have a, a project at the, at the present time on, on learning analytics, um, policy development for universities. And it, this was an eye-opener to me because I thought as, a, as an innovative university that was on the top of all this stuff, we would find learning analytics easy and we would tell other people how to do it. Uh, wow, was it hard. None of the rules that we had about collecting data from learners were the same and consistent across the university. Everybody's permissions that they asked when they got the data were different. The data holders didn't want to give up the data. We found we had to formulate it so that we could export it. And we had to formulate questions that we'd never thought about before, about what influenced what. We found that really hard. But universities that get on top of this and in this competitive world, universities that get on top of this and use it well will undoubtedly find that the education that they can offer to students and the support to students as they go through the process will be enormously better than anything that the, the majority of universities offer at the present time. So um, if you want, to, the website is, is there, I think, and, and you can look at that one. So, so that will clearly come through to us. One that I watch with great interest, which is more American-based than European-based, but you see it arriving here, and it's dismissed, actually. I, I find a lot of my colleagues dismiss competence-based um, education, the testing of competence, explicit testing of competences as you go through. Um, I think that this, as it matures, will form a very attractive kind of education to those people who have jobs in mind and who have upskilling in mind and actually perhaps those who think that the cost in, 
countries like yours and mine, where, where, where education is charged, well, England and, and yours, where education is charged for, um, and, and the debt and the, gra and the value of having a, a degree is actually less clear. I think that they will find this approach of being able to evidence competencies. Learn how you like, at the speed you like, and then somebody verifies that you actually do know, are able to, can um, uh, demonstrate learning outcomes. Um, it, we are quite poor in higher education and, and I think particularly poor in, 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 in schools at, at looking at that. And, and when you ask the population, this is a US model, but there have been similar discussions um, gone in other countries. If you ask people about whether students should be able to get credit for stuff that they learn outside universities and it should be made part of their, uh, a part of their qualification, then there is a general agreement that, that, that students should be able to get that competence. And there's a general agreement, actually, if you like, that the time that we take, if you've mastered it and you should be able to get credit without having to spend all that time, um, there's a general agreement too that that, that self-paced would be desirable. The other change that's coming, and it's stronger in some countries than others, some countries are more protectionist about their higher education systems in particular, uh, the UK has become very liberal in this, is the emergence of, of private educators. Although, as I say to people who are in other countries, actually, now that we've gone online, your learners can go where they like for stuff. So you may not have private providers in your country, but there's plenty of private providers in other countries, and they can go to them if they wish without ever leaving the country. And, it's quite, and so that regulation you've got. I mean, I think that this is a mixed thing. It's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, I always have uh, BPP sitting there on my, on my list. Because BPP now in the UK is the dominant provider of accountancy education, more than anybody else put together. It runs all year round. It's got relatively flexible on-demand type of stuff. It's got time and place flexible study. And none of the university courses that existed at that time had any of those sorts of features. And so you can see that, 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 that there's innovation and there's rethinking by some of the private providers that may drive universities then to rethink what they do. So where they do a good job, private providers actually are often to be able to break away from the... Um, baggage of the past, if you like, and show new and interesting ways of doing things. And we are beginning to see universities in the UK now that are actually beginning to run on, on a full year cycle rather than on a short year cycle, particularly in these professional areas. Brown's already mentioned um, shifting international flows. I think I've got a brighter, more colourful picture than, than he had about it. Um, but, but, but the point is here that, that, that Minority providers of higher education, um, of, of international higher education, like China, and, and, and that's what's on this, this bottom right-hand one. China is the bit down in, I don't, do I have a pointer? Down here in, the, in, in this bottom corner here. Minority providers of higher education may increasingly pick up the international students who come now to the West. The flows are predominantly into the West from the East. But as China raises its profile, raises its international status of its universities, raises its profile, we may find that the international students who come to us and those of us who charge international students significantly high fees may find some of that money goes away because we actually have much more competition. If you link it to what I said about real-time translation of voice, etc., Actually, that would be even easier. And there, it is clear that at least at postdoctoral level, Chinese universities now are attracting students from the West. I know quite a few people who have actually gone to Chinese universities to do postdocs just because of the quality of the research which was done there. So, so we can't assume that our students will necessarily stay within the same areas. There may be increasing attraction from other parts of the, of the world to universities. I think that one of the things that we're all going to have to get to learn in, in higher education is actually how to enhance productivity. I mean, it's a dirty word with my colleagues, but productivity enhancement is really important to us. I mean, how do we cope with um, a rising demand for higher education and at the same time reduce the costs. And when I look at my own university, our understanding of the costs of teaching 
We're actually really poor. We have very poor measures of what it costs to deliver any given course. And this showed up particularly when we were trying to cost online courses versus residential campus courses. And online courses turned out to be more expensive. And the reason was that we actually never costed real estate into the cost of teaching. And of course, online courses have no real estate cost, but on campus too. And also the other thing that we were unable to quantify was the fact that online courses were flexible in time and space, whereas on, on campus courses were all locked in a curriculum. And I don't know what the cost of being locked in a curriculum and of, 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 of curriculum um, limitations are. So I think that for all of us, and this is true in Europe, I think regardless of, of whether we are public or private in, in, our, in our nature, we are going to have to understand cost and price much more particularly to compete with private providers who understand it well. And then finally, I want to go back to the dirty word of disruption. Um, it, it's quite, I found this quite interesting quote that, that, came, from, um, that came from John Hennessy in, um, in, in Stanford about MOOCs. Um, and you can read that on there. Um, I, there was a lot of hype about MOOCs in the early days and about how they, how they would disrupt higher education. And then, of course, it actually turned out that higher education rather absorbed them and, and so, as a consequence, they didn't appear to be disruptive. But actually, I think that some of the things that we can see coming through now are actually um, beginning to take us towards disruption. So disruption then, lower gross margins, smaller targets, simpler products and services. And, and the traditional providers poo-poo them because they say that they are poor quality and they're not very good. And that's exactly what people said about MOOCs, and it's what people often say about private providers. But actually, over time, um, those providers polish their product and market conditions change and so as a consequence the, the consumer moves away from that to, um, to, to the new from the old. So that forces me then to look at higher education and say well are the conditions, are what we do, are we in that position where we are ripe for disruption? What are the features about us that actually make us um, more likely to, to be unable to, to fend off, if you like, and, and to survive through the rough seas through change? And I've used this slide before, and, 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 and no apologies for that. I think that when you look at real universities, real colleges, and indeed actually real schools, um, you find that there are features about them that are, that are unchanging and really hard for us to change. Um, I think our interlocked curricula are hard. Um, there's a lot of question about, I think, about skill sets of faculty, but skill sets of students. Um, and I think for individual universities, there's a lot of risk involved in being different to anything else. There's a lot of risk for, the for a country to change the way it offers higher education because everybody else is still doing it the traditional way. So I think there are a lot of things in higher education that conspire to make it very difficult for us to change, but I have a sort of personal taboo list, if you like, of things that I think we need to break, and this is my last slide. A historian, modern historian colleague of mine was giving a talk that I listened to and he was talking about disruption, he was talking about, about Xerox and, and, um, and Kodak and, um, and um, you know, uh, traditional bookhouse publishers and he said that the problem with them was not that they didn't see that the problem was coming because they all saw this problem coming, they just found themselves unable to do, about, do anything about it. And so I think there are a set of things that we find ourselves unable to do something about, that we have to do something about if we're to move into this more flexible, agile world. One of them is the academic year, for which there is no logic at all in, in the present time, in my view. But you suggest in a university that it should get rid of its academic year, and you find that really difficult. So that's why it's at the top. Minimum time to graduation, you know, that you can't get out any faster. You have to go at this speed because we have this slow repeat rate of modules. And you can learn as fast as you like, but the exam is on that day, whether you like it or not. You are forced to go at what may be a glacial speed for you. We're, we're obsessed with degrees rather than courses for credit. And I think this is worse at bachelor level at the first degree, first cycle, because you can't get out with anything in the middle. 
There's, you, you come in and the only thing you can get out with is a bachelor degree. We don't have qualifications that take you out in the middle. I think we're awful at recognition of prior learning in general. There are some interesting universities in the States, small private ones, that do phenomenal recognition of prior learning, especially dealing with the vets who come in um, from scattered military training. We are really poor at accepting external qualifications. We don't really understand our prices. And actually the truth is we have almost no personalization. And we have very limited options for work and study. And so if we move into a world in which um, moving out to work is a more common um, desire among young people, then that ability to move in and out of work as you study, even in your first cycle degree, I think will be one of the things we will have to develop. So unless we can get rid of some of those taboos in there, I think that we are actually in a sense, in a position for, right for disruption. That if you Google the thing at the bottom, you'll find my written essay on the subject, because there's always got to be an academic output on, on, on everything you think about these days. It's part of the competitive world. So um, that's me. I'll leave you with that slide of my taboos, and I'll hand over to Chris for his talk. Thank you.